So welcome everyone to this uh, workshop of specialized topics in wind power. In the first, this is our first try of this. This workshop is 2021 version. So um, in this, this workshop, um, the intention of this workshop is to uh, share uh, experiences related with academic projects that uh, it's been what, two kind of academic projects. One uh, work uh, together with uh, the, uh, the Instituto de Energías Renovables, the Wind Power Group, uh, and develop it together with uh, some external institutions. In this specific case, like today with the U University of Reading, and. Um, and also some projects uh, of uh, these researchers that we've been working in these uh, recent years, as in the specific case of HANA, which I am uh, very happy to present and introduce her today. So I will uh, give you a short um, biography of, of HANA. Hannah Bloomfield, uh, she is, uh, Dr. Hannah Bloomfield is a re research scientist at the University uh, of Bristol. She's between jobs right now, who has spent the last eight years working at the University of Reading, studying the impacts of climate variability and climate change of national level in power system. Hannah specializes in modeling UK and European electricity demand and renewable generation. She has also worked on developing these tools for Mexi Mexico and multiple regions of Africa. A key outcome of her work has been to improve the accessibility of large meteorological data sets uh, to non-specialists. So um, Hannah, we, we have uh, this collaboration uh, with Hannah in the past couple of years. So for us, uh, we are very happy having her here. So I won't take any more time. So please, Hannah, microphones are yours. Um, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. It's really great to be here. Um, I recognize quite a few names here in the in the meeting, obviously Lulu and Gustavo who came to Reading, but others of you as well, I think I recognize from when we had the meeting whew, a couple of years ago, the workshop in Reading. So it's great to be back and see some of you online. Uh, yeah, so what I'm gonna talk to you today is about a couple of projects I've been working on, thinking about European energy systems. Um, so what I think about a little bit more, I guess, I think about more aspects of the power system than just wind power normally. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to some of these other aspects and maybe it would be nice to think about how they compare to what we see in the wind power um, modeling that a lot of us all take part in. So thank you to all my colleagues at the bottom who've been involved in this work. Um, so let's go. Yeah, so to start with, I'll give a little bit of motivation. Um, then we'll talk about impacts of climate variability in Europe. Um, part three, we'll think about some impacts of climate change. So I know a lot of you think about present day climate. I think there's some really interesting extensions when we start to go beyond reanalysis and start to think about climate change simulations. Um, and yeah, as, as Osvaldo said, everything here is a European focus, but I'm sure you, a lot of you recognize Oscar at the bottom here. Um, we're doing a lot of work on Mexico. Um, and also two of my colleagues, we're doing work looking at Africa and India now. So diversifying a little bit. Um, yeah, so why do the energy sector care? I'm sure I don't need to tell you all this, but you know, to meet these government targets, we have to make our, weather, our energy systems more weather dependent. And so as the systems become more weather dependent, we increase the variability on lots of different timescales. Um, so we know that energy demand, um, which Lulu's going to talk about, is associated with temperatures, uh, maybe wind chill and relative humidity. Um, wind power is dependent on the wind speeds. Um, solar power, 
on the short rate of irradiance and temperatures. Um, hydropower, precipitation and runoff is important. And then the grid itself is also very dependent on particularly extreme weather. Um, but yeah, multiple timescales are important when we think about energy systems and weather. So we might think operationally, if we're thinking about managing the grid and keeping the lights on, we might be interested in short range forecasting products or maybe hourly reanalysis data. Um, but as we start to look at different kinds of decision making in the energy systems, we need different kind of meteorological products. So today, my focus is going to be talking about how we can use reanalysis data um, and climate model projections. So um, output from future climate simulations to think about impacts on energy systems. Um, and it's actually a really topical um, situation going on, which if any of you have looked at the kind of global news or looked on Twitter recently, um, at the moment in Europe, we're experiencing a really bad wind drought. Um, so it's actually the lowest recorded wind period in the last 60 years. Um, and you can see on this plot here, this is data from era five going from 1960 to 2020. And the colors show that we're actually in a lot of regions over the UK, the least windy um, that it's been over the last 60 years. And for those of you who've come to see us at Reading, you might know that a lot of this coastal area um, up towards Scotland and down the UK and in this kind of coast between Wales and Ireland is where we have a lot of our wind farms. Um, so this is one of the many challenges that we have when we come to incorporate wind power in our systems. So just thought that was a nice example as it's happening right now. So yeah, the first piece of work I'm gonna to talk to you about, thinking about how year to year climate variability impacts on power systems. Um, so this work was done with some colleagues from Newcastle University who are energy system modelers. So Matt Deacon, David Greenwood and Sarah Sheehy. So what we were thinking about is how the wind power um, starts to matter when we transition our source of heat. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. So motivation for this, um, as we know, the weather is not the same every year. Um, and the evolution of our, um, well, we know that we need to decarbonize our power systems. This isn't just a case of building lots of renewable generation. Um, that's important, but also we need to stop using gas um, for our demand and we need to stop using um, coal, we need to find cleaner fuels. So this leads to this kind of evolution in the demand weather sensitivity. Um, um, we might use different, there might be different methods of how this heat demand might grow or decline with time as well. And what we were interested in was the year 2030 because um, that's about the year when we have good projections for what wind farms we might build. Uh, we're pretty certain of that now. And also what our energy system might look like when we go much further forward again, very, very uncertain. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about heat for a bit. So in Europe, we really need to decarbonize our heat. So um, our demand is split into lots of factions. So it can be broken up into heating, transport, heavy industry, um, agriculture and waste processing. But this big section of the pie chart here, 37 percent of all um, UK emissions in 2016. Um, it's very similar now. This is all heating. So that might be heating water, cooking, space heating or industrial processes, but it's all heat. Um, and the problem we have in the EU and in the UK is that the bulk of this heat comes from gas boilers like this one here. Um, so, yeah, all of our radiators, a lot of us will use um, gas heating. Um, water heating is sometimes electric, but mostly gas. Um, and this is a big problem because um, we're trying to reduce the amount of gas we're using. Um, so one possible solution to this is that we can build heat pumps. Um, let me just see if I can close that, there we go. So yeah, we need to build heat pumps and these are a very cost effective way to decarbonize heat. 
So heat pumps can either just be air to air or they can be air to water. Um, but the basic premise of how a heat pump works is that we have the outside air, it's blown across an evaporator um, where the heat energy is then absorbed by some kind of refrigerant. Um, it flows through a circuit that it can be compressed and condensed out. And then that heat can then be used to distribute around our home. Um, so this is very efficient. It can also work in the opposite direction in the summer if you're too hot. Um, and generally would be a thing. The main problem for us with these is they are, the heat pumps themselves are quite, um, quite big, physically big. So you need quite a bit more space than you had for this, um, whoops, uh, this little picture I have here of this gas boiler. You need much more space for the heat pumps and they're also quite a bit more expensive. So they're the main kind of barriers at the moment. Um, so how did we decide to try and model how our uptake of heat pumps might change, including our renewable generation? Um, well, we worked with some full energy system modelers, which is something I've never done before. Um, I tend to do things very similar to what you guys will do and focus very much on the weather side of it. So this was quite interesting. Um, so we started with historic demand data. Um, we took our reanalysis data. We took, I think it was, I think that we used MERA2 for this as an input. We built a linear regression model um, for the demand. And we also built a model to calculate the wind power and the solar power generation to get this very large Heinz cast for all of the year. I think we did about 30 years worth of Heinz cast. What we could then do is start to calculate factors like the system margin. We were very interested in times when the system might break. Um, and then we calculated these metrics. So a loss of load expectation. Um, these are the three worst hours a year that could happen for the system. So the three most expensive hours um, and also this ACTS, additional capacities to secure. So this was basically saying if we had a really bad wind year and a year with high heating demand, how much extra power would we need from somewhere? Maybe we don't know the source yet. Um, and the key thing we did was we used the locations of the wind farms. This is all focused on GB. So when we were modeling demand, we used the population data over here. So everything was weighted by where people lived. Uh, this is all from open access global databases, um, all readily readable in Python. Um, and also we have these two um, offshore and onshore um, wind setups. So as I said, a lot of our wind power generation is around this kind of east coast and west coast area of England there. Um, so we split it offshore and onshore so we could get two different time series and see the different behaviors. So how do I get from weather to energy variables? So this is a common procedure um, that lots of people do in the literature. So we fixed our power system set up. So we picked a level of demand we wanted. We were, tw we were interested in 2020 and 2030. And we picked a wind turbine setup and a solar power kind of setup. And we backcasted that the last 40 years. This is 05, but I think it was Merit 2. Um, so our demand model is predominantly dependent on temperatures. Wind power model is based on 100 meter wind speeds. And the solar model is based on temperatures and solar radiation. Um, so all the data is actually available on the Reading Research Data Repository and the methods if you're interested in exactly how we did this, but just quickly. Um, to mind, we use a method, well, it's a linear regression model with a special tweak on the end called lasso regularization. So what this does is um, it looks at, it, it builds a regression model, but to decide which terms are most important, um, it looks at the coefficient of determination and every time you add on another factor, um, so for example, here we've got temperatures, we've got time of the day, um, knowing whether it's Saturday or Sunday, um, what else have we got? Fridays, um, solar radiation, um, wind speeds, lots of different factors. We pick a cutoff here and we, we kind of pick the most important variables and then we stop once I think we hit 0.9. 
And you get a trade-off here between how complex your model is, so how many different parameters it includes, and then this kind of fit that the model has. And Matt, Matt decided to fit the model here. This is my colleague who did most of this. Um, but we were able to fit a good model because we had many years of reanalysis data to compare to the demand. So the wind power modeling. Um, so our wind power models, um, yeah, as I said, we use the Merit 2 wind speeds. So in Merit, in Merit 2, what have you got? You've got 2 meter, 10 meter, and 50 meter wind speeds. So we built a uh, relationship and then we extrapolate these up to the average hub heights. Um, so we looked in our, we're very lucky in the UK, we have very big databases of where the current wind turbines are located. So we know that our average onshore wind turbine um, hub height is 58.9 metres and our average offshore is 85 metres, so quite a bit higher offshore. Um, so yeah, we extrapolate the Meritu wind speeds up to those two heights and then we pass them through one of these power curves. Um, so we've got two different power curves, one for onshore and one for offshore. So these are taken from National Grid, our transmission system operator, and they're a bit kind of smoothed out and that represents the farm level behavior um, rather than just having a spiky power curve, which drops straight off at maybe 25 or 20 meters per second. So this should account for any wake effects that are being seen and things like that. Um, and our solar power model, finally, this is a, um, an empirical model. So our capacity factor is the ratio of the power that's coming out to the power of standard test conditions. Um, so which basically is this efficiency factor, which is dependent on temperature, um, times by the ratio of the solar radiation and compared to the best possible solar radiation. Um, so what this means is basically the sunnier it is, the more solar we start to generate with a bit of a cutoff that um, once you start to get very warm, the panels don't operate as efficiently. Um, so all of these models fit quite well. We get very good R squared and RMSE. Um, you can have a look at the papers if you're interested. But yeah, they mean that we've got these very long time series. So just as an example here, um, on the left hand side, we've got our demand in the UK. Um, so we see that we hit our peak demand at about 6 p.m. when everyone's on their way home from work. And then it drops off again um, in the evening. From um, looking at lots of Lulu's plots, I think this looks similar to some regions of Mexico, but um, I cannot remember which ones. Um, so the key thing is this is the demand. And the shading here shows the variability um, of the winter season. So we see there's quite a big range of demands we can hit. Our peak gets up to about 60. And our lowest point at a different part of the day is about 30. If we do demand net renewables, so this includes um, the wind power generation and solar generation, we see that it's lower down because we've incorporated the renewables, but there's a much larger spread that we see here. Um, so this is really important because it's showing that including particularly the winter wind power generation puts a huge amount of variability on top of our demand. Um, because across Europe, we see that temperature variations are much smaller than wind speed variations across the whole region, um, which makes wind power the really critical factor um, for where we live. So other things we, we think about in this paper, um, when we're trying to think of all these different types of uncertainty, um, the main thing here that we consider is heat pump profiles. So this is basically how much extra we will add on to our demand because of the extra electric heating. Um, so there's three different ones taken from the literature that we looked at. So we looked at a flat one, which just says, oh, the same thing will happen throughout the whole day. And then we've got these two different profiles that just um, give a kind of sense of where extra demand might come from if we increase the ele electrification of heating. Um, the plant on the plot on the right hand side is just to point out that because we were working with energy system modelers, they were also thinking about factors like um, current coal and gas generation and when this might retire. Um, so it got very complicated, this modeling framework we were using. So yeah, this is my favorite plot from the study that we did. Um, it's a lot going on here, so I'll just step you through it. So 
along the bottom we've got lots and lots of different winters um so let's just focus on this far one 10 11 to start with so what we're looking at here is the additional capacity to secure so it's comparing if we were to do all of our calculations about how much power we need based on the average climate so just picking one year which represents the average conditions compared to if we were to incorporate all of these different um, years of meteorological information. So for us, 2010-11, very cold and very still year. And we see here that um, there's two different things. There's if we left our heating system as it was, so without the heat pumps, um, or if we include some heat pumps there, that leads to this um, spike up even further. Um, but yeah, basically, if it was a particularly cold winter, we have much more additional capacities to secure. Um, and with heat pumps, so if we compare these kind of wind turbine shapes to the crosses, um, with heat pumps, we see there is a greater weather sensitivity. So these little crosses always lead to more additional capacity to secure than there was before. So the colours show you the mean temperature anomaly that's being experienced here. So we see that generally when it's much colder, um, we need more um, capacity. So we need extra energy for heating. Um, but there are these odd years like this year in 1718, where it's very cold, but we don't need much capacity. And this is because of the wind power generation. Um, the, wind, the availability of the wind generation is incredibly important for our um, power system because we are we have about 20 gigawatts of wind power installed so in theory that could meet about a third of our demand um, and in years like this one um yeah it was very important that we did that we had a lot of wind even though it was very cold and the final plot i wanted to show you from this is just an uncertainty analysis so a lot of the work that I think a lot of you do and a lot of the work that I normally do just considers kind of weather uncertainty. How different does a different year's weather data mean to what might happen in a power system? But what they actually did in the study is they considered loads of different types of scenarios. So the red dots here are these uncertainties due to the electrification of heating, um, which is a really big uncertainty. So there are two types of models here, explicit and NGESO, don't worry about the difference about that for now. Um, but yeah, basically the biggest uncertainty we currently have um, is heat pump scenarios. But what was interesting for me is that if we consider this um, bar chart on the far right, weather is the second biggest here. So the, the little blue bars um, show you the uncertainty due to weather. Which in our situation, a lot of that is the is the impact of wind power generation. Um, so this is much bigger than any of the uncertainties due to the modeling um, and due to the kind of sensitivities within the, within the model. So it shows that weather is incredibly important to be modeling accurately and using lots of weather years. Right. So just to summarize that. Um, we looked at these kind of system adequacy problems. So thinking about meeting peak demand and transitioning to electrified heat. We use this 30 year data set of demand, wind and solar power. Um, and one of the things we find that this heat pump uncertainty is incredibly large and um, building more heat could lead to an increase in our temperature sensitivity by 54% in um, just four years. So electric heating, um, could double the variability and capacity we, we consume. And it's something that's very important to think about. Um, so at the moment, over Europe, wind power is the biggest player in the cause of variability, but we showed that actually um, this could be coming up quite a bit more from the demand side now. Okay, so let's talk about the impacts of climate change. Um, this is a study that came out last year where we looked across Europe and looking at different climate change projections. So we all know climate's changing. Um, and this gets quite interesting when you're thinking about renewables because um, European temperatures um, and temperatures around the globe very consistently um, show an increase um, in air temperatures. And, and yeah, we can see here, so there's a lot going on in these plots, but we've got six different climate models, which are each the little black dots. 
Um, and for each climate model, we're looking at the um, annual mean and then seasonal mean European temperature change. So RCP 4.5, quite a high end climate change scenario and RCP 8.5 is very high. Um, so basically we see that um, the higher the, the greenhouse gas inputs, the more the temperatures are changing and all the models show the same side of the sign of the change. Just about these bars. So the dot is the mean climate model response. And we put some error bars on it, which kind of shows the sampling uncertainty for each climate model. Um, so we had like a hundred year series and we showed how much it matters, which particular 30 years you picked in the time. Um, so for example, if I was interested in 2080 um, to 2100, how much does it matter if one of the years in there isn't included? Um, so yeah, as we said, the European temperatures, this is a very robust response. But if we start looking at European wind speeds or certain or surface solar irradiance, the models do very different things. And from this, it is, makes it quite difficult to estimate the impacts of climate change um, on power systems. So this is something we went on to look at. So we did this using a platform called the ESEM Demonstrator. This is a project that some of my colleagues worked on. Um, if you're interested, you can go on the website. You can basically point and click and see graphs of different climate model projections um, across different European countries. But the key information here is we had seven different climate models because um, we, we are very aware that different climate models have slightly different responses due to the way that they've kind of um, solved the equations of fluid dynamics. And we also had five different energy scenarios we were interested how big um, the impact of energy policy choice was compared to the impact of climate. So the first thing we looked at is these energy policy choices. Um, so we were looking, we had data from 2015 out to about 2070. And you can see here we have these five different scenarios and they kind of do what they say on the tin. So small and local is lots of solar power on roofs and lots of very small things. Whereas fossil and nuclear is um, basically not changing what we do now, just still building coal gas and everything gets bigger. Um, so you can see here, this is just showing the total load. Um, so this is the equivalent of the demand. And each different color is a different um, energy scenario. And within that are all the different climate model solutions for the two RCP scenarios. Um, so what we can see here is by the time we get out to 2070, our future power system uncertainty is really dominated by the energy policy choice. We really do not have a clue what our future energy systems are going to look like. Uh, and this actually surprised me quite a lot when we found it, because I thought the impact of climate, all these different lines would be a bit bigger than it was here. Um, but a really key point is this doesn't mean that climate change isn't important. Um, because we have to make a policy choice. Um, governments will pick one of these sets of lines and we'll go for it. Um, so what we decided to do is to pick one of these sets of lines ourselves. Um, I think we actually picked one which was a normalised version of this 100% renewables. Um, and then we looked at the impacts of climate change within the scenario. Um, so firstly on demand. Um, so here we find that by 2050, national power systems may be subject to considerable impacts of climate change. Um, so this is averaging over the whole of Europe. So all of the European countries added together. We see that on average, annual European demand will go down and the higher the climate change scenario, the more it's gonna drop. Um, but seasonally, there are some different responses here. So in summer, demand's actually going to increase quite a lot as we increase our need for air conditioning, particularly in Spain, Portugal, Italy, um, the nice sunny countries. Um, whereas in winter, um, this is uh, we'll have huge reductions as our winter temperatures are warming quite quickly. So demand's dropping in winter because we need less heating, but increasing in summer because we need more air conditioning. But all the models agree the magnitude of this change they might have um slight um discrepancies on but they all all agree on the sign um if you unpack individual countries so for example if we look at sweden in northern europe 
in Sweden, all of the countries, um, sorry, all of the seasons, um, winter, spring, summer, and autumn, see a reduction because <laughs> it never gets warm enough in Sweden that you would maybe need your air conditioning um, on in summer. So they're all just seeing these reductions in heat and demand. Whereas in Italy, um, actually, we see an increase in demand just due, due to this very large increase in demand in summer. Um, so not all European countries have the same response. And even across a relatively small area like Europe, we have very different heating and cooling requirements um, depending on whereabouts we are. So then maybe the most interesting bit for you guys, the impacts of climate change on wind power generation. So this was really interesting for us. These seven models that we picked all just all did relatively different things. So we see here that the colored bars are very small. So the multi-model mean change in wind power generation is not very big. But for example, I have circled a model, um, one of the seven models, which has a very large um, positive um, change in wind power generation, which would be great um, if it got windier. Yeah. Um, but all of the other models are doing different things. And this just shows that, you know, the impacts of climate change on wind power generation is very sensitive to the choice of models. Um, it's also quite sensitive to the choice of years used to compute the results. So we see the bars um, around these dots. So the bootstrap analysis we did showed that just excluding one year out of our sample leads to quite a big difference, actually, in the magnitude of this change. So that's basically telling us that wind power is still really affected by climate variability in the future. And in most cases, it's still affected a lot more than it is by climate change. Um, um, solar power generation. So the impact of climate change on solar is, it is sensitive to the choice of the climate model again, um, but it's much less sensitive to the years used. So we see across the whole of Europe on the left, um, that on an annual sense, um, we maybe get slight reductions um, in the amount of solar power generation on the multi-model mean, but all of these seven models did something very different. Um, so potentially the multi-model mean is a very bad metric to use for this, and we should maybe unpack these individual model responses in a much more detail. And again, this is really um, uncertain as we go into different regions of Europe. If we were to take Sweden in this top right plot, we see here it's generally getting a lot um, cloudier, there's less solar power generation. But for some of the scenarios, like this RCP 4.5 winter scenario, the results are all over the place. And um, we wouldn't be able to say with any confidence happening. Uh, similarly, in Italy, there's a lot of, lot of changes here, but it's less sensitive to the choice of years in the simulation. So what's maybe interesting is that um, we thought about what, how, what happens when we change our energy system makeup. So at the moment, um, the moment Europe's got a reasonable amount of renewable generation installed, but we're planning to increase the amount of wind and solar hugely um, in the coming decades up to 2050. So the plot on the left hand side here is showing us, so 2016, which is the point we started this work, oh dear. Um, this is the amount of demand minus renewable generation. Um, so this is how that will change between our two periods. So I should have said we are looking at the difference from 1980 to 2010 compared to, I think it's 2070 to 2100 in terms of the climate change level. Um, so, yeah, we can see here at the moment, because at the moment our main... Um, uncertainty due to climate is around demand and around temperatures. These, these, um, the responses here are pretty certain. So we're pretty confident if we left our energy system exactly how it was, um, but included quite a large amount of climate change, that most of this response is driven by our response due to demand. Um, however, if we build lots and lots more wind power generation and lots and lots more solar, um, which are variables that the models are not very confident of the response on, um, then suddenly this picture gets a lot more messy. Um, so the inclusion of renewables makes it much harder to understand the impacts of climate change on these systems. 
Okay, so just to summarise part two. Um, future power system uncertainty is really dominated at the moment by the choice of energy pathway. Um, however, there is this significant sensitivity still due to the, the choice of climate model, the RCP scenario, and the impacts of interannual climate variability. Um, the response of demand to climate change is very consistent. Um, we understand very well how the um, as the planet warms, we'll need less energy for heating and a lot more for cooling. Um, and also the response to European wind and solar power generation is very complicated, um, particularly in the context of current events. Like I was contacted today um, to comment on, there's a phenomena called global stilling, um, which is very pre prevalent in the literature, which talks about over how the last, over the last 30 years, generally wind speeds have been going down across the world which could be associated with climate change because our pole is warming um, much quicker. This reduces our kind of thermal wind balance. So, yeah, a, a much more thorough consideration of climate uncertainty is therefore needed. Um, and when we do make our energy policy choices, we do know that it's going to be very important um, to really robustly account for future um, for climate change in our power system design. So there's a lot of small work to do in this area. Um, as, and collaboration with power system modelers is really important. Um, so, and I've put at the bottom here, access to data is a huge challenge. I'm quite privileged that I have all this data, information on location of wind turbines, many years of demand data across the whole of Europe, which we can use. I know that in some places this is a much bigger challenge, but I think better access to data makes it a lot easier for all of us to do our work. Um, and that was my last slide. So I hope that some of that has been interesting or useful for you all um, in understanding kind of, yeah, how, what we've been doing at the University of Reading in Europe and hopefully how some of your wind power work feeds into this kind of bigger picture. So, yeah, thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. So please, if you have any questions, you can drop it at the chat or you can raise your hand and um, please make it. So any questions? Okay, so one, I, I will, uh, I, I want to make a quick question. Ah, here we have a question, Alejandro Martinez. He says, he says, thanks, where can we get any kind of uh, API to extract the data? And the second question is, why did you choose linear regression? Have you tried with any uh, machine learning model to improving the performance? Yeah, they're good questions. So, um, Alejandro, when you say the API, do you mean the API for the weather data or for the energy data? Maybe you can answer that in the chat or appear here. But um, so for the second part, uh, yeah, it's a good point. Why did we choose linear regression? Um, firstly, because it was an easy way to get started. Um, and we, the, the weather data, okay. Um, so yeah, so we use linear regression because it's an easy way to get started. I don't think it's very good for this, to be honest. I have used it a lot in the past in my past work, but it's very difficult to unpack the contributions of each variable. So, for example, as inputs to this model, we put temperatures and we put solar radiation. But both of those two terms are very highly correlated. So it's really hard to unpack um, in a statistically rigorous way with the linear regression which one actually is most important to the demand. So um, in that respect, it gets quite complicated. And in the most recent work we've been doing, we've been trying to work in anomaly space. Um, in terms of machine learning methods, so there is a, a PhD student I'm working in at Oxford who's doing some wonderful things. She's using neural networks um, to try and do this in a bit of a in a bit of a better way. I don't fully understand um all, all of the machine learning methods but she's actually been showing that um these linear regression methods are not actually very good at capturing extremes so they're not very good at capturing the peaks um, that we might be interested in 
But with something like a neural network, um, providing you've got a good enough training data, um, there's a lot of a lot of good information there that you can get. Um, so yeah, maybe I can share something about that afterwards. Um, okay, so APIs to get the weather data. There's some really good places online um, to get it globally. So if you want current climate, um, there's something called the Climate Data Store, which I can put a link to in the chat afterwards. Um, that has a Python API attached to it, um, where you can download um, loads of different, so reanalysis weather products, um, which is kind of past weather. You can also get weather forecasts, and they do have some climate model data on there as well now. Um, so you can get yeah, all kinds of weather data through the Climate Data Store. There's also um, something called the CEDA Data Archive, so the Centre for Environmental Data, um, which is a UK-based archive, but anyone can use it. And it has loads and loads of um, observed station data on it, if you're interested in like weather stations but also global climate model output um, is all stored on there. Um, so if you want to use the weather data, it gets very big, very quick, but there are some good resources for um, either supercomputers you can go and work on or APIs to download your own subset. So I'll share a link at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, does anyone has any other question, please? Okay, okay, one, we have one hand raised, let me, okay. Okay, Lourdes, Zamora, please, uh, can we open the microphone or we, you should, yes, you can do it. Yes. Hello, Hannah, thank you. It's always really nice to hear you. So my question is related with the temperature. You mentioned that the change in the temperature will kind of limit the wind flow but also as the, the air density is related with the temperature, do you know how it will impact the wind power generation of the existing sites or of the potential sites? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, I don't think the density is quite a big enough factor to matter, but these changing temperatures, so. The main argument is that like, uh, as it gets warmer, the poles get warm quicker. Um, so at the moment we have this kind of, it's called, the meteorological phenomena is called thermal wind balance, but basically it sets up where our jet stream sits um, across the North Atlantic. Um, and if, um, if the pole warms a bit more, that jet stream might shift forward but also our gradient in temperatures um, is weaker. So um, the winds are all really generated by how strong this temperature gradient is between the equator and the poles. So as that tends to weaken, it's possible um, that the um, winds will get a bit less over Europe. Um, there's a lot of other factors as well, though. It gets very complicated. Like you can see from my results, all the climate models have a bit of a different idea about how important this is. Um, and there's lots of other factors like um, the land surface um, absorbs heat quite differently in the different models. So that decides how quickly the land warms um, and the just the actual the parameterization of the wind, so how they're actually getting these near surface wind speeds cannot be very good in some of the models. So it's quite difficult, but um, yeah, potentially, you know, with climate change, wind is something really interesting to look at because um, wind power seems to be the main renewable that people are going for. And as far as I can see, I don't think it's very well understood. Like when I read papers and things, or they, they you can find a paper that points in any direction uh, that you want to say. Some say it will get windier, some say it won't. So I think it's a big future challenge, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Lulu, for your question. So I think that, uh, 
we we take this moment to thank Hannah again. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you here. So please, everyone, use your reactions and uh, let's give Hannah a big applause. I think that, yes, we already have applauses. Yes, we have it. So thank you very much, Hannah. Mm -hmm.